Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Brad Wolfen, and I'm here with Embersec. Embersec is a boutique cybersecurity firm specializing in advanced cyber operations, technical services, managed detection response, and governance, risk, and compliance advisory and assessments. We're excited to present to you today, and I've prepared this session to cover the current landscape of remote work, some recent trends we've been seeing and are tracking, and some security controls and best practices to keep in mind as organizations move to more comprehensive work from home policies while maintaining productivity and business continuity. A few reminders as we get today's session started. Your microphones have been muted and will be muted for the remainder of today's session. With that said, we encourage you to engage with our panelists through the chat box. A couple of screenshots here for you so you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, you should have access to a chat box. So please feel free to use that to engage with us. If there are any questions you have as we discuss content moving forward, uh, themes, concepts that you would like us to dive into, we're happy to address those at the end of today's session as we've saved some time for a panel discussion and Q&A. And those questions that we're not able to get to during today's session, we will certainly follow up with you with answers via email after today. And last but not least, today's session is being recorded and will be shared. So as soon as we have time to pull and process the file, you can expect to see this come through in your inboxes. Um, and uh, that follow up will likely happen early next week. To uh, present to you today, we've lined up three different panelists. The first is Mr. Cedric Hines. Cedric is a security engineer here at Embersec and represents the MDR team. Prior to joining the team, he was a security operations center lead contracting for the federal government and worked as a consultant for deployment and integration at FireEye, assisting to better secure his clients' networks and integrate their products with processes becoming a subject matter expert for various cybersecurity products. Cedric has a Bachelor of Science com in Computer Network and Security from UMUC and enjoys learning about and exploring new technologies. Next, we have Mr. Ken Jenkins. Ken is the CTO for Cyberspace Operations from Bylight and runs the Embersec Vertical. Ken brings over 24 years of information technology and cybersecurity expertise in red teaming, pen testing, hunting, threat emulation, incident response, and security engineering. Ken is a decorated combat veteran and retired soldier. During his active time, his duty responsibilities covered operations and defense of DOD networks and battle command systems. Some of his assignments included various combat units, the Army's Criminal Investigation Command, Army Cyber Command, the United States Cyber Command, and the NSA. Ken regularly competes in CTFs and is a technical mentor to the Cyber Patriot program. He earned his bachelor's in technical management from DeVry, holds over 30 commercial certifications, including CISSP, OSCP, and 12 GX certifications. And last but not least, we have Mr. Luke Willitson. Luke is a security consultant here at Embersec. He began his cybersecurity career in the United States Navy, where Luke trained to conduct offensive security operations for the Department of Defense participating in daily computer network exploitation missions in support of national intelligence requirements and in support of protection against foreign nation state sponsored hackers. After separating from the Navy, Mr. Willitson joined this uh, IronNet cybersecurity. During his time at IronNet, he conducted penetration tests, vulnerability assessments, and provided product development support and threat hunting capabilities. And just before coming to Embersec, Luke was at Ankura Consulting Group where again, he specialized in red teaming, pen testing, intel gathering, threat hunting, digital forensics, and technical writing. Luke has a master's degree from Eastern Michigan University and a CISSP, OSCP, and CEH certified. And before I pass it over to Ken to kick things off, I wanted to run through the agenda. Um, so today we've uh, prepared for the following categories um, and slides referencing to start uh, a bit of an overview of the landscape. Um, as many of you know, um, organizations are moving to comprehensive work from home uh, policies as a result of the spread of the coronavirus. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about kind of the, the framing that conversation and some of the struggles that those organizations are, are experiencing as they move into remote work. 
Um, we'll follow that up with a, a bit of an overview on uh, some malicious activity, the rise that we've seen in various phishing attempts and other prevalent scams. You may have heard of some of them. We'll point out uh, some of the, the moment in time ways that uh, malicious actors are capitalizing on the current trends and, and the state of, of uh, our, our working environments. We'll talk about the basics, how and why to implement some best practices, things like multi-factor authentication, using a VPN, and how important communi communication is in terms of policy changes, expectations, maintaining compliance, et cetera. And then finally, for those of you that are a little bit more technical on the line today, we'll take a deeper dive into what we're calling tuning the tech. So how you can kind of take the next step in uh, ensuring that those best practices that you have implemented are reflective of your business needs um, at a bit of a deeper level. And then finally, as I mentioned, we have saved some time at the end of today's session for a Q&A. So we will uh, blend a Q&A with our panel discussion. Um, and again, just a reminder to plug the chat box that you're seeing in the lower left-hand corner. If you do have questions as we discuss these concepts, please feel free to lob those our way. And we will have our moderator read those off to our panelists uh, at the end of today's session. So with that, I will hand it over to Mr. Ken Jenkins. Hey, Brad, thanks, I appreciate it. So um, I'll give a quick, quick situation uh, update, you know, with, with, with the pandemic going on right now, you know, businesses are, are moving to a central model, but they also are fortunate that we have the technology to, to support a, a, you know, a work from home workforce, a remote workforce. Um, so, we, we, you know, some of the things we use to, to kind of make that possible and, and have business continuity is, is the use of more email, you know, WebEx, Microsoft Teams and Slack for, for that real real time near time chat communication, um, Google Suite, Office three sixty five. You know th th those are things that are, are really going to be leveraged more with the workforce. So to continue, you know, in, in to to continue with business continuity, um, you got to have the right tools. You have policies policies in place and procedures for the for that remote remote workforce to be able to you know conduct telecommuting and and, and keep the business running. Um, but there are some things that can really cause problems during the pandemic. And so those are some of the things we want to discuss today. So I, I will I will cover uh, a couple different phishing scenarios. I'll talk about uh, some some of the some, some of the things you'll see in emails and, and, and things you can do to avoid uh, being a victim victim of this. Um, next slide. So you, 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 there's there's been a pretty significant rise in phishing, um, over 600% alone just since the pandemic started. Um, one 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 thing one thing to note is even prior to the the pandemic, uh, phishing was still the number one uh, vector into you know a target target network or, or company's organization, um, and, and you know. Phishing is done for, for many reasons. Some is to gain access, some is to social engineer, some is to steal valuable uh, you know, company proprietary information. Um, and, and one of the things that, that, that you'll be, or well, a few of the things you'll be seeing is, you know, how, how, how do you prevent COVID-19 infection, steps to, to receive your economic stimulus check and, 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 and you know, patients requesting how to do Corona, Corona uh, excuse me, Corona uh, virus testing. So, I, in my inbox alone, I've seen a significant rise on on this, and just the hashtag or, or hashtag of Corona or coronavirus or COVID nineteen definitely on a rise. And when those things pop in your inbox, and you're already, you know, you're already slightly panicked. Um, the pandemic's probably got you got you a little concerned or scared. Um, you probably have a bit of anxiety. You, you, you you're, you're seeing a lot of chaos in the world. And, and oftentimes you can fall prey to an email um, as it comes in. Um, so there's a few tips that, that, that I, I recommend. Just we'll, we'll, we'll touch on a couple of these in the following slides. But, you know, if you're not expected to send receive an email from from someone and you do, you should probably look and validate is 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 the sender's email look correct? Does it match? the content of the body of the email is that what they're talking about is I expected from that person. Um, is the language, you know, specific to you? Uh, is it, is it induce a sense of urgency 
if anything this urgent over email, you should probably take a step back for a second and, and dissect the, the, body, the body of the email, the sender's address, the subject, maybe the signature block, um, and also look at the grammar and the, the consistency of how that, that person's communicating with you. Um, so I'm going to cover a couple examples of some fishing you're likely to see and, and talk about some things that you, know, you could possibly counter them or not fall uh, prey to the, to the adversary. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here is one where the World, World Health Organization is emailing someone directly. So it's, it's probably unlikely that anyone from the World Health Org is going to send you an email directly and probably not from an individual account. So in this case, it, it came from an individual. And he has a picture there. It kind of adds to the, to the, you know, the, the realness, I guess. The, the authentic, it, 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 it gives a, a dimension of authenticity in a way because he's got his picture in there. Um, but again, likely not going to receive anything from the director of World Health Organization. Also, if you look at the subject, it says, you know, this is a response, meaning you have sent them an email and they have responded. Again, I doubt anyone's communicating directly with the World Health Organization. And then within this particular uh, email, there is embedded links. Um, and for this one particularly, this was an attempt to spread uh, malware. And in the particular malware, here's a keylogger. So if fall fall prey to this or fall victim to this uh, attempt, um, you would you, it would result in malware executing on your on your laptop or workstation, and this adversary be able to key log your keystrokes um, and use them use them for uh, other other activities. Next slide. So in this particular one. Uh, there's language in here about home at home tips to stay healthy with COVID-19 um, and how and how how and when to be tested. But what 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 concerns me about this one is obviously there's there's grammar mistakes, there's um, misuse of capitalization. Uh, there, there's also telling you not to do something like hey here here's 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 this uh, information, but don't we ask that you not share this before it's ready to go out. And then there's also an embedded link. Uh, so again, from top to bottom, this was a forward. Um, you're probably not going to get a forward like this uh, on any on the coronavirus from people you work with or authoritative sources. It'll probably be the original email. It'll probably come from a legitimate uh, sender, and it, it, it likely isn't to have a, a bunch of embedded links. Um, this one has an embedded link in, in the uh, in the attachment. Uh, so a couple things there you can pick up on. Next slide. So phishing isn't the only thing. You know, you know uh, there's other other attempts um, to, to conduct fraudulent activity. So malicious app applications, uh, landing pages, or what I recall is water holing. So you know, you, it, the, the victim gets duped into clicking on a link and gets redirected potentially to a landing page. Their browser gets enumerated. Maybe there's a vulnerability on their browser, um, and you know, an exploit could be delivered, and access could be gained. Um, and, and you know, there, there's various reasons for to do this for the adversary, but generally it has something to do with har harvest uh, harvesting credentials. Um, collecting personal data or credit card information to enable other operations or selling your, your information potentially on the dark web. Um, so there's, there's many, many security companies right now dealing with this and trying to alert, alert uh, their customers, um, you know, specifically Sophos, Fortinet, the World Health Organization. Um, some of our partners are, are doing the same. Um, one, one recent hoax of uh, uh, point you to is that, you know, the Android store has a lot of uh, really cool apps and features and constantly there's a, a new capability popping up. Um, the one that's, that people are really interested right now is tracking the COVID-19 infection. So there's an app called COVID Lock that claims to provide real-time tracking, um, but this, but COVID Lock contains a variant of malware, a ransomware particularly, 
is known to lock your screen. Um, so COVID, the COVID lock, if, if, if it's enabled on your device, um, will require you to pay $100 in Bitcoin um, to unlock the infected device. So if you don't unlock the infected device, you lose access to the data. And, uh, it, you, you know, it, it could cost you a whole lot more than $100. So oftentimes folks will pay it and, you know, they, hopefully they don't get exploited again. Next slide. So in this particular uh, scenario or, or situation, this uh, true fire is provides uh, tutoring and lessons uh, for working out uh, or for, for workouts with uh, learning to play instruments. So, you know, they, they've, they have about a million followers or a million visitors a day that come to their website. Uh, and they've really had to rely on their e-commerce e platform to accept payments. Um, but, you know, it, it was discovered that customer data was being stored and, and was being stored by an adversary. They, they, they had exploited the, the website and were able to uh, sift information as, as customers were paying for, for, the, for their uh, services. Um, so for, for this one in particular, there's, there's very little that uh, someone visiting the site could do. But for technology companies, you know, they're, they're, they're constantly have to be, be vigilant with patching their applications and, and monitoring their, their solutions to make sure their, their customers aren't falling prey because of a vulnerability they may have. So there's many other things you can do. Uh, lots of other security controls, you know, but, but this, is, this kind of covers the threats. So I want to kind of jump into security controls now and pass it over to Cedric. Thank you, Ken. Um, next slide. Okay. Uh, this is about going back to the basics of uh, cybersecurity for good cyber hygiene during these times, as well as for the future that will help networks be more resilient to cyber threats. One of these is to implement multi-factor authentication. There are many different types of soft tokens that are out there, such as Microsoft Authenticator, Google Authenticator, Duo, and many more. With a simple setup as installing software on your phone and then scanning a QR code when the user goes to log in next time will help ensure that only appropriate users are logging into the network or using corporate resources. Another is using a VPN. There's a full VPN if bandwidth can handle it, However, a split tunnel VPN will ensure that data that's destined to the corporate network is encrypted as it transverses their, their net. Next is making sure that patches and updates are still being applied. I've seen, seen small shops have users email the Windows update screen showing that their laptop has been updated to enterprise patching software that needs only internet connectivity. If your current patch management uh, solution requires more hands-on, make sure that it will work with endpoints that are con connecting through a VPN or might only have internet access. Communicating effectively the policy changes and expectations to employees that are now working remotely. There are a lot of people now that are working for the first time from home. So now, <clears throat> excuse me, so knowing what an employee can and can't do is essential. For example, can a teacher electronically send grades via email to their students at the end of the semester? <clears throat> so communicating out what how normal business is now being conducted, which might change as uh, everyone adapts to the, the new remote work. This is also about creating a culture of if you see something, say something. Meaning if a weird email comes your way, someone asking for your credentials or to install something that you're unsure about to report it, which means everyone will need to know who to make these reports to. Lastly is digital distancing, which is the practice of separating your work laptop, <clears throat> you know, potentially to a, a separate router or, you know, network or ensuring that, you know, you, you're performing work things on your work laptop um, and not, you know, uh, personal activities, as well as, you know, making sure that if you are able to separate it, that means, you know, your personal laptop, you know, gaming consoles and internet of things aren't able to access it. That might not be feasible in some cases. 
So having a, a good VPN client uh, that has you know some local firewall rules running can help mitigate that. Next slide. When it comes to setting up these technologies and policies, the end goal is to prevent unauthorized access to your network and resources. However, there is no one size fits all uh, solution to securing your network. Though here, there are some quick questions that can help you get started uh, on finding what that solution that will fit your needs. What is my budget? Knowing what your budget limit is will help eliminate solutions that will fall outside and also let you know what type of solution can be architected due to maybe additional servers that have to be installed or additional bandwidth. Next, what technologies are currently in place within my organization? Current technologies within the network might be able to be leveraged to assist in securing a remote workforce, such as unused VPN connections on the firewall, upgrading a license to utilize more of the VPN connections, um, as well as some of the agents having basic vulnerability scanning uh, in the event that your normal vulnerability scanning becomes ineffective. How many employees need to work remotely? This number was probably calculated when the employees would rotate the telework schedules or work from home and work from the office part of the day. Now you're trying to calculate all the employees that can work remotely, which may overload the current VPN concentrators. To offset the high usage on the physical network, potentially using cloud resources um, might, might need to be leveraged such as Office 365. What are the security requirements to my organization? Are there regulatory obligations that must be met? NIST, HIPAA, PCI. Um, are there security requirements that must be met uh, per a client agreement such as SLAs? Security requirements defined by your own organizational policies, you know, such as the telework policy. All these need to be taken into account when looking at uh, upgrade or additional security tools, as well as printing, scanning, and document destruction based on the organizational classifications need to be addressed for the remote, remote workforce. And lastly, how can I ensure the remote work is secure? You know, there's a there's several different ways you can look at, um, you know, log monitoring, vulnerability scans, uh, tracking help desk calls, or you know, different you know metrics that you can use to to find out what's being effective and not effective, as well as monitoring you know traffic through the firewall and the blocks. Um, one of the places I worked before, you know, we were able to locate an employee who was um, not doing work appropriate things on his laptop due to the fact that he had a habit of, you know, doing this activity between the hours of 7 p.m. and 10 p.m., which were outside the normal business hours, so it was very visible to us. As well as, you know, alerts that are, that alerts that come through on, you know, antivirus solutions, spam guards, and tracking other emails that, you know, employees will report to you. And now I will turn it over to Luke, who will go into deeper into some of these available technologies. Thank you, Cedric. So I'm here to talk a bit more about VPNs and also a second remote work option. We'll get into some implementation do's and don'ts, and I will also give a few anecdotes about how remote work solutions have played into my work as a penetration tester. Um, for the health of our organizations and for our economy, we need to keep working if it's safe to do so. So um, let me cover something really quick here. Um, when do we not need a VPN? And the answer to this is really for some organizations or maybe some employees at some organizations. So uh, these employees don't actually work with confidential or proprietary information. They, it's not part of their workday. And these employees likely don't need to connect to a VPN. Um, I don't want to encourage you to wastefully spend money implementing secure remote work technologies if you don't need them, but most likely you do. So you know you need a VPN or you already have one and you want to know what you can do to make it secure. Um, first of all, I'll say that the biggest reason to use a VPN is to separate your home network from your corporate network um, and to encrypt all data that passes between your 
remote system and your corporate network. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have multi-factor authentication, um, also known as MFA. MFA is the biggest roadblock that you can use to prevent unauthorized access. You need to get it working. And if, you, if you're using a VPN without MFA, you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, as a penetration tester, I have, you know, fished someone's credentials before and it was their Active Directory credentials and I was able to use those credentials to log into the client's VPN um, without multi-factor authentication um, and gain access to pretty much their entire corporate network because they had a flat network structure. And, you know, this is something that you do not want to happen. And MFA is a huge countermeasure against unauthorized access. Another thing that you want to consider is your network segmentation. When VPN users connect into your network, you don't want them to have network access to, the, to your entire enterprise. What you want is to protect your local assets through another layer of authentication. And I would consider using granular firewall rules to restrict the access of VPN users. This access should be equivalent to about what an employee's level of access would be if they were sitting at a terminal at their desk in their office. Another huge thing that you can do to protect your enterprise is to restrict the clients that are allowed to connect into your VPN. Ideally, you only want organizationally owned devices to be able to connect. And this allows for you to manage and enforce updates for security, um, endpoint security, firewall rules, OPS encryption, endpoint detection and response, and uh, to write your own rules for USB data transfer. So, you know, with, with, uh, with rules and policies that you configure and enforce, you know, these remote systems can be just as secure as your on-prem workstations, um, almost. So the goal is for remote operations and infrastructure to be the same as on-prem. You want them wholly managed by your IT and your IT security. Um, another anecdote, so I have connected to, to many VPNs uh, during penetration tests just directly from my Kali Linux system, uh, which is an operating system uh, custom built for hacking. Um, you know, and and so if these uh, if these organizations enforced a rule that only allowed their systems to connect, I wouldn't have been able to connect in with this you know with this hacking system. So um, it's definitely a good thing to enforce that. Another thing you can do is. Um, Make that make sure that your VPN clients are periodically re-authenticating, um, and this will help prevent unauthorized access. You know, if if someone steals your laptop while you're logged in to the VPN, you know, at some point they're going to lose access because they don't have your credentials to log back in. Um, and the final thing here is uh, you can discuss uh, using your SIM uh, with your SOC if you have one. And you can use it to track when users are logging into your VPN and um, look for unusual activity. You know, let's say Joe in accounting, uh, he, he doesn't log into his VPN at 3 in the morning. He never has. And for some reason, this happens. So you can give him a call um, with, uh, you know, if you get an alert, you can give him a call and either A, He's not on the VPN and he'll tell you that and then you know that you have an, uh, an incident to investigate. Or B, he is on it and he's already awake so he doesn't mind you giving a call anyways. Um, so using a VPN with secure organization known workstations is a good idea to be sure. Um, but I would like to talk about an alternative solution. So uh, next slide please. So one big alternative to using a VPN is uh, the use of remote desktop technologies like uh, Microsoft's remote desktop services and virtualized desktop technologies like Citrix, Hyper-V, VirtualBox, VMware Horizon, um, and more. So, you know, it might be more financially conscious for your organization to leverage remote or virtual desktops. Um, so remote and virtual desktops can be very secure and they can be hosted uh, on-prem or in the cloud. And um, 
a solution like this requires, uh, significantly reduces the number of assets you must manage to track. Um, Real-time management of these systems and their associated policies is easier um, due to the centralized nature. So you don't have to track down Joe's laptop if he hasn't powered it on in two weeks um, to make sure that you know that system has mandatory security updates. And um, you know, remote and virtualized desktops. This is a direction that many organizations are heading in because you know the benefits are, are immense. Um, but the problem is that the cost can also be depending on the size and nature of your organization. So um, this type of solution requires some serious computing power as well as some serious bandwidth, especially for large organizations. But I would say that it is an investment in the future. Another issue is that um, users that are going to log in and use uh, a remote or virtual desktop, um, they're going to have to have their own device that they can connect in with. Um, you know, it just requires a, a web browser, but you're going to want a keyboard and a mouse. And in the smartphone era, not everyone has that. So that is, that's a small, you know, bridge that you might have to cross, but um, it shouldn't, shouldn't be too big of a problem for your organization. Um, so here's what you're going to want to do if uh, this is how your organization is conducting or is planning to conduct its remote work. You're going to want to protect these remote and virtual desktops with basically all the same provisions I discussed for securing the VPN and the associated uh, laptops or desktops that are logging into the VPN. So, you know, you're going to look at multi-factor authentication, endpoint security, endpoint detection and response, uh, firewall rules, um, authentication timeout, and um, writing your own rules for uh, USB data transfer. There, there's, there's many, many other ways, but these are just kind of the big ones. Um, but there's one extra thing for remote and virtual desktops, and it's that you should absolutely disable the clipboard functionality. Um, ideally, you want to prevent any single byte of data uh, from coming into your corporate network um, from a host that is uh, a client to your remote or virtual desktops. Um, you know, with the clipboard, as a, you know, on penetration tests, I, I have logged into multiple um, remote or virtual desktop solutions and leveraged the clipboard to just copy and paste, um, you know, scripts at, uh, from my malware just directly into a terminal um, and not have not had to bypass, you know, firewall rules and proxy rules or, or any of that complicated stuff. I just copied and pasted my malware. So um, that's why you want to disable the clipboard. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a small logic chart showing kind of a simplified flow of questions you would want to ask for employees and whether or not they should be performing remote work. So, you know, if your employees are not handling confidential proprietary information, it may be safe for them to conduct remote work. If they are, you want to make sure that they are using a VPN or other secure remote access technologies, such as um, remote and virtual desktops. Um, if you don't have that, then your employees shouldn't work remotely until you do. Um, but if these employees have been issued a laptop by your organization and these laptops are employing recommended security controls and your VPN is robust enough to handle all of this remote work, then it's probably safe for your employees to work remote. Now, if you you know haven't issued your employees a laptop, but you have remote work, um, or remote desktop or virtual desktop technologies, um, and these technologies you know prevent data transfer between the client and virtual host, and your technology is robust enough, then it may be safe for your, your organization to allow remote work. Um, so Cedric actually has a few additional considerations to discuss. So I'll go ahead and pass the floor back, back to him. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, these additional considerations uh, to take into account. Um, from one of these would be the uh, stresses on your organization's environment. Um, can the current infrastructure and bandwidth support the remote workforce? 
If it cannot, what needs to be done in order to support the workforce in the interim? Uh, with employees working remotely and relying on new mobile applications that might be on their phones, now is an excellent time to put policies in place on the best practice for their usage. Also, if there are technologies that are out there for mobile device management or mobile application management. Um, I've found out that if users are using their personal phones, it's more acceptable to have an application management instead of control of the full device. For externally hosted applications, security groups uh, and settings are a responsibility of the customer, and they need to be configured accordingly in order not to have a data leak or breach. Many leaks have been due to cloud ap applications being misconfigured and data being exposed publicly. And as always, regular audits um, of current security policies and procedures to ensure that all assets are covered, accounts are configured appropriately for least privilege, and no unnecessary ports and services are exposed. For sites and services that are publicly available, they will need to be make sure that they're patched, have all the security tools that are operational, as well as monitoring for any adversal, adversarial behavior. And now I'll turn this back over to Brad for the panel discussion and QA. Thanks, gentlemen. I appreciate all the insights. Uh, I had some really good talking points there. And um, I know me for one, take it personally in the, in the whole work from home setting, you know, the being bombarded with emails and a little stressed out and distracted, adjusting to the new settings and environments, um, working different hours, longer hours, so all of these tips are, are fantastic, and um, I'm sure everyone on the line learned something today. Um, looking at some of the chats um, that are coming through, we do have some questions. Um, so I thought it would be good to kind of blend our panel discussion with um, the Q&A. And we'll get started with um, this one that's come in um, specific to small and medium businesses. Um, Ken, I'll, I'll lob this your way to get us started. Um, the question is, being cyber safe and resilient to adversaries can be overwhelming and expensive. What is your advice for small businesses that are just starting out? And what are some of the first steps we need to take to establish a strong foundation? Sure. Thanks, Brad. So kind of re repeat your question a little bit. So uh, a company starting out and they're looking to uh, first steps with cybersecurity to be resilient to adversaries. So I think the one that is kind of, overlooked uh, well actually there's a there's a couple that are overlooked uh, one is understanding your threats um, so you know establishing what we call in, in the cybersecurity industry is a is a threat model or a threat profile so your your threat model is likely um, you know someone who's targeting your particular sector um, and they generally are going after something that you that you have a value. It could be access to another net, another customer, it could a partner, it could be to your uh, users, it could be proprietary information. But it, it, it's 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 good to know that who who actually would target you, what their capabilities are, and what you can do to kind of counter those or mitigate those risks. So with with mitigating risk, you, you or, or with with risk management, you're usually looking to mitigate risk, transfer it. Uh, uh, re reduce it completely, um, but you, you know. I, so back back to the the question: It's ha have have a threat model and understand uh, you know what what your threats are and how you can counter them. Um, some of the first steps w with doing that is uh, you know user awareness in your organization on on what threats are and a shared understanding of that. Uh, of that threat model, I, I think is is a good start. Um, you know, I we, we talked about a handful of things throughout throughout this uh, talk today. Um, I will tell you also you, you use the mindset of you're trying to increase the cost to the adversary, but you're kind of keep the cost to implement down. So you you have to balance that. Oftentimes, compliance is the bare essentials of what you need to do, but um, really focus on. Re Threat reduction is, is, is a good start. Great. Thank you, Ken. And um, the next one that's come in, uh, Luke, you talked a little bit about encryption. So um, I will throw this one to you. Um, the question is, can you explain encryption 
Are there different ways to encrypt things? And is it actually effective in preventing information from ending up in the wrong hands? Okay, sure. Um, well, let me keep with the theme of not getting um, over technical here. So think of encryption as very complex math. And you're using this math to transform your data into a state that is not recognizable. Um, the goal with encryption is that only the key can decrypt this data. And encryption does ensure data integrity and confidentiality if you're using strong algorithms um, and a good key. So with encryption, there's kind of two states to note. Um, when the data is in transfer and when it's at rest. So a VPN or um, TLS encrypting uh, secure HTTP, uh, this is you know data, encrypted data in transit, whereas um, on disk encryption uh, will protect data at rest. Um, and encryption, I would say, is extremely effective. And often, when you're using it, you don't even know that you're using it because it's transparent to you. Um, you know, when you click connect on your VPN or, um, you know, authenticate to a remote desktop or, or log into a secure web application, um, it's it's transparent. You, you don't have to worry about it and it's, and it's already been handled. Um, but again, encryption is incredibly effective and, you know, in this day and age, easy, very easy to use. Um, thank you. Thank you, Luke. Um, and it looks like there's one more that's come in. Um, this one I, I might kind of uh, pass around the table and, and Cedric will start with you. Um, I, I know all three of you have, have several certs under your belt and have been in the industry for quite some time. Um, this individual is asking, are there any training or other informational resources that you may recommend uh, to keep my team knowledgeable? So Cedric? Um, so for me, I've, uh, I've personally used in the past, uh, like Cyberary or Udemy, um, but there are, there are quite a bit of online resources, uh, that are out there, uh, both free, um, and paid. Um, I know some of the, the, the paid ones will actually have an enterprise, um, addition on it so that if you're, if, if the people that you're looking for to, to use it you can get a better pricing model. Um, but there's definitely a lot out there to use. Great. I've definitely heard of Cyberary and um, we'll check out Udemy. Um, hey, Ken, how about you? Yeah, so, so quite a few. I, I, I think uh, one of the best places to get started is following folks on social media because um, that's really where relevant, timely, uh, news is, is really is really shared uh, you know recent recent exploits adversary activities um, campaigns malware that's in the wild um, so I, I would start there with some of the major security uh, uh, practitioners that are constantly sharing their information all some of the major security product uh, vendor vendors um, I really like uh, sans when it comes to training. Um, and then I, there, there's a company that, that provides a, a really cool uh, cybersecurity training for their workforce. Um, it's 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 uh, Treetop Treetop Security. They have a slide deck that you can download for free to train your to train your your workforce. Um, and, and and they keep that that curated. And you know they you can you can. You can tweak those slides uh, for their for their for for use of training, and and also there's some supporting material. Cool, I'll check it out. Um, and Luke, we'll uh, wrap up this question. I'll, I'll lob it your way. Anything you have to share? Uh, sure. Uh, first, I just want to echo what Cedric said about uh, Cyberary. I actually um, have leveraged. Uh, a lot of their training as I was preparing to get some of my, my own certifications. Um, but um, in addition to that, uh, Know Before uh, creates um, workforce education in cybersecurity programs. Um, 
uh, I actually worked at a firm in the past that uh, worked with Nova for for and and to provide their services to their clients, and it really was fantastic training. Um, and I think it really made a difference among uh, you know the layman practitioner. Um, and I, I will say that I'm not uh, affiliated with them in any way, and I don't gain anything by telling you that their training is good. So <laughs> thanks. Great. Well, folks, I think that wraps us up for today. Um, I want to thank our panelists, Ken, Luke, and Cedric. Really appreciate the time you took to prepare those slides um, and for the information that you've shared with our audience today. Uh, for those of you that are still on the line, um, if you do have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to the Embersec team directly. Um, the phone number on the screen or the email address here for you, info at embercybersecurity.com is a great way to get a hold of us. As well, we have active social media accounts, both on LinkedIn and Twitter. So give us a follow. We're uh, regularly posting blogs on these current trends, things that we're seeing out there in the wild, some best practices, et cetera, um, sharing news. Um, and it's a great way to stay in the loop for future webinars that we'll be hosting over the next several weeks. So thanks for attending today. Hope you're all well and healthy. Enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you next time.